one of the most frequent questions I received on social media is where and when to see or to photograph the Milky Way. What season is the best time uh, to see the Milky Way and how to capture that? Because the Milky Way is the most iconic element in the night sky away from the light pollution. And in this webinar, a part of my 2022 Sky Events Photography webinar, I'm explaining how to capture the galaxy. Some photographers are interested to capture this typical view of the Milky Way arch rising over the east, which is best visible in between February to June. If you start in February, you need to wake up early morning, around 4 or 5 in the morning, and you will see this Milky Way arch rising. Stars are rising about four minutes earlier each night. Due to the Earth rotation around the sun, each star is rising four minutes earlier every night. That means in about one month, the Milky Way is rising two hours earlier, 120 minutes or two hours earlier for the same position in the sky. So it's very easy to calculate that if we go from February to June, in June, you will see the same view in early evening. That's why June and July, it's so-called the Milky Way season. However, most photographers don't realize that the Milky Way is the galactic bulge, the brightest part of the Milky Way, could be visible in late winter as well. It is visible in the spring as well. You just need to have to wait a bit more until, um, the, until the galaxy is rising. This view is captured from California. I do an annual workshop there with my colleague Mike Shaw every year, either in June or August during the Perseid meteor shower. And one of our locations is just on the foot of Sierra Nevada in a place known as Alabama Hills. Another place is Bishop. And this year is going to be also in late June and uh, around the Mammoth Lakes area. One of the two, one of the two workshops I'm doing in the US this year. Speaking of the techniques, um, it's a typical golden numbers of night escape photography. 20 seconds, f2.8, and ISO 6400. It's a panorama made from six vertical shots and combined together the super wide angle lens at 14 millimeter. The moon is right behind me. So it, if you like to use the moonlight on the foreground, you have to plan ahead of time to see when your subject is on the opposite direction compared to the moon. That's when the sky above the landscape will be still dark, especially in high altitude areas where the air transparency is better. And the moon is illuminating the foreground perfectly without vanishing the sky above the foreground. So they need to be as far as possible. So that means the moon needs to be near the horizon, either rising on this occasion, the moon was setting. This is a first quarter moon, which sets right after midnight. And that's the amount of light you get from this moon phase of about 50%. It's a perfect illumination. If, it, if the moon is a phase of 70%, a gibbous or 80% or full moon, there is no chance for the Milky Way. If the moon is less illuminated, for example, a crescent moon of only 20%, there is no chance to reveal the foreground to this extent. Doing this type of night escape photography is based on planning, which I will talk about it too. The Milky Way is no longer in August, September and October, is no longer like an arch that has passed. Now you will see it over the southern horizon, August, the perfect time to see the Milky Way. And in September and October is gradually shifting towards the west, southwest, and it's becoming like a beautiful column over, uh, like a river almost, over the western horizon. Both of these images are captured in Yellowstone National Park, a latitude of around 45 degrees, and that's where you can see the galactic bulge right above the horizon, but not much higher. This is still continue to be one of the most exciting and interesting time of the year to capture the beauties of the night sky. Especially in September and October in Northern Hemisphere in generally, we have more transparency. And it's a very nice breach between the summer sky 
and the winter sky. If you shoot the whole night, you will see all these transitions. At the beginning of the night, you have the summer triangle, which is visible over here in this picture. These three bright stars in the center. And you will see the Milky Way. As the night goes on, you look back to the east and you will see the winter constellations are rising with Taurus and Pleiades, the seven sisters, the star cluster, and then Orion, Gemini, until the morning comes. In the winter time, we see a different part of the galaxy in the evening time. That means uh, the prominent observation time. This image from Colorado in, in the Rockies is showing you a ghost down in the foreground, which I have illuminated that building with a little LED inside during the 20 second exposure. Most of you know, uh, my photography is mainly based on single exposure photography. Some of them are photo sequence in order to create longer star trails, but more of them are either single exposure or stitched panorama of several single exposure images. I like to challenge myself with single exposure photography. So many interesting methods in that that has been practiced by photographers, you know, like Ansel Adams, and it's still useful today with modern digital cameras. So in this image, Orion is the prominent constellation in the sky. The winter sky does not have much appearance of the Milky Way, and I will tell you the reason. But instead of the Milky Way, you have plenty of bright stars. Some of the brightest stars in the entire night sky are visible in the winter time of the Northern Hemisphere, including Sirius, the brightest star in the Earth night sky is this one, Sirius. It is bright because it's only eight light years away from us. And over here we have Aldebaran. This orange star is um, one of the giant red giants. Uh, or this one, Betelgeuse, on the shoulder of Orion. Betelgeuse is one of those stars that can become a supernova anytime. It's a star at the very end of its life cycle. And it's giant. If it was inside the solar system, the outer surface could be after the orbit of Jupiter. Exposure is very similar in this image, um, but the Milky Way is not that much popped out because we are looking to the outside of the galaxy. In the summertime, you're looking towards the center or the so-called galactic bulge, while in the wintertime, as well as autumn, you're looking to the suburbs and outside. And since there is no a concentration of the mass and the stars and nebulosity, the Milky Way becomes fainter. While in the summer view, you're looking to, to galactic center and several very rich galactic arms, including the Sagittarius arm, which is um, very close to where the galactic center is located in the sky between two constellations, Scorpion and Sagittarius. This is the brightest part of the Milky Way. Speaking of the winter sky and back to that point about stars rising four minutes earlier each night. Look at this illustration from a starry night software. January 22nd at 7 p.m. as you can see in the upper part of the screen and this is for the latitude of around 40 degrees. It's Washington DC so it's mid latitude. Um, Orion and Gemini are rising at the beginning of the night in January. One month before that, at the same time, Orion was much lower on the horizon. You can also measure the change with your hand in the sky, completely extended arms. This is 10 degrees, your fist. So you can easily calculate this. If you know that the star four minutes earlier, so in one month, it's about two hours. And each hour for the Earth rotation is 15 degrees. This looks like the beginning of the Milky Way season, the popular part of the season, June 21st. It's the summer solstice night. The Milky Way arch is rising right at the beginning of the night. This is 10 p.m. In fact, it is possible to see the same view of the Milky Way right now. This is tomorrow morning at 6 30. So the Milky Way season begins in late January, in fact. We are now comparing the Southern Hemisphere view and the Northern Hemisphere. I'm not sure how many people are attending from the Southern Hemisphere, but I'm pretty sure some of you may want to try photographing the Southern sky because 
some of the uh, elements in the southern sky are so unique and more attractive to most night escape photographers, and I will explain that. But the first difference is not only new constellations you're going to see, including Southern Cross, which is the smallest constellation in the entire sky, but very iconic. Um, the main difference is that some of the iconic constellations visible from the Northern Hemisphere would be upside down in the Southern Hemisphere. These two images are from similar latitudes of 30 degrees in two different hemispheres, one in, in Iran on the right side and one in Southern Australia in Tasmania. And Orion is looking about the same time of the year in December, one during the winter time in Iran and the other one during the summer time in Australia. And the view is of course upside down. Another difference is that in the Southern hemisphere, we can see the galactic center overhead. While in the Northern Hemisphere, especially mid latitudes and high latitudes, such as 30, 40, or 50 degrees, the center of the galaxy is closer to the horizon. The further you go down towards the tropics and then Southern Hemisphere, the center of the galaxy rise higher and higher until when you are just below um, the equator, you start to see the galaxy overhead. And that's what the Aboriginal Australian, for example, imagine as this giant emu in the sky with the body uh, made of the galactic bulge and the neck is going all the way to, to constellation Southern Cross and where this black nebula known as Colsac is located. This view, is only visible in that part of the world. And that's the very reason many photographers would like to capture the night sky in the Southern Hemisphere. When the center of the galaxy is so high up and it's so bright, it could be easily visible even with the moon in the sky. In comparison for the Southern Hemisphere sky between this time, which is their winter time and our summer time, same month, it, we are still talking about between February to October, November. That's the Milky Way season. But in the Southern Hemisphere, it goes to the peak during the winter time and for us in the Northern Hemisphere during the summer time. This is the view of the Southern Hemisphere summer time, which is our winter time. So during, for example, in between November to March, the iconic part of the sky during that time is over the south, which is the upper part of this fish eye view. Both of these images are made with a fish eye lens, a full circular lens, which can cover 360 around the horizon. This is just one single shot. You can cover the entire sky when it's properly oriented towards the zenith overhead. This one is a few, it's a panorama. So it's, it has a bit more than um, the 180 degrees field of view. And when you're using this lens, um, the perspective is kind of unusual, but it's very useful, not only for educational reason, for creative uh, presentation of what you have seen, but also for planetarium purposes. If you have a planetarium locally and you like to contribute, this is the way to go. It's also good for capturing virtual reality images, 360 virtual reality to use with the VR glasses especially if you do it as a panorama and continue with the foreground with whatever is located underneath the horizon all the way to the nadir point, then it becomes a complete VR. Back to our point, uh, the view during this time of the year for the Southern Hemisphere is most interesting over South, which is here, including the two galaxies, which are completely invisible in the Northern Hemisphere. And there are satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, dwarf galaxies, known as the Magellanic Clouds. They are visible to unaided eyes very prominently. And also next to them is the Southern Cross, the Colsag Nebula, and this little nebula visible here is known as Carina. The Southern Hemisphere view of the Milky Way arch. Instead of rising now, you have this view in setting time which is in October, November evening sky. This one was photographed from Australia, the National Observatory. And also in July, August in the morning time. 
or you can see the Milky Way rising in May to July in the evening sky, and that can be in the morning sky in February, April. Speaking of the technique in this image, it's a self-posed panorama. So it's a panorama of about eight shots. The camera is vertically oriented. On one side is the moon, that's not the sun. The moon is setting at about midnight. So this is again, um, a first quarter moon setting in the Atacama Desert of Chile. And since the altitude is high, when the moon is close to the horizon, the Milky Way becomes completely visible because the moon is getting dimmer and dimmer as it's getting close to the horizon due to the atmospheric absorption of light. When the object is closer to the horizon, there is more absorption of the light and then the object becomes dimmer. But still, it's bright enough to illuminate the foreground, as you can see on the hills over there. But the sky is not totally vanished. Just above my head is the large Magellanic cloud, and on the left is the center of the galaxy rising. Um, when I did the panorama, all the shots were regular, but one of them where I was supposed to be in it was on a self-timer. So I went there. The self-timer was running for 10, 20 seconds, and then the shot started. I had to froze myself to about 10 seconds, and that was it. 